Um, anyway, we so we started two years ago. We were inspired by the Global Implementation Science Symposium that Dean Fixon, whom you'll hear from in just a few minutes, uh, leads up, and Sonia Schoenwald participates in. Uh, that inspired people in California from various fields, education, mental health, human services, and criminal justice to come together to see can we bring some awareness of and hopefully eventually some technical assistance for bringing the principles of implementation science to work in California, helping us all with the struggle that we've had forever of taking promising practices and installing and spreading them and really making them part of our everyday lives. So our first major activity was a symposium a year ago, and we met in, at UC Davis, had some great information to provide, and also asked our participants, what would you like in order to move ahead with using the principles of implementation science? And they, we got the ideas. They gave us some ideas. They wanted to hear more about the basics of implementation. They wanted to hear about building capacity. And based on reflections of a very lively conversation on our opening panel between Dean and John Landsberg, who is also very active in this field, people really wanted to know more about fidelity. Dean and John had a, a great conversation that asked more questions than it answered. So as we moved forward, we were aware of that, doing some basics of implementation and some conversations about capacity. This year we've instituted a webinar series. This is the second. We did one on Implementation 101, which relied heavily on a document that was developed for the symposium by Savon and others. And Savon, I think, will show us how to, how to achieve that, how to get to that document on the, the Internet, the Implementation Science Guide, and you know, the Resource Guide. It's a great, as you explore these ideas, it's a great resource. So moving ahead, we've got another webinar coming up in a couple of months that will focus on capacity building, using groups for capacity building. Looking forward to doing more symposia, but today is really all about learning more about fidelity from the, the acknowledged experts in the field, Sonia and Dean. So I'm going to turn it over to Savon to introduce them, unless Barry, I missed something, and you'd like to add something about the collaborative. No, Stuart, I think you covered it. Um, and um, the information about the symposium um, from last year, including this resource guide, is um, on our website. Um, and maybe, Savon, you can show them how to get there from the home page of our website so people can find it, because um, I don't have a, I'm not a presenter on the webinar. Um, the easy way, so I, can you all see the CalSoc website? Yes. Okay, so I have the home page of the CalSoc website. The easy way is to do a search. However, um, if you don't do a search, you go to Evaluation, Research, and Implementation. And um, I, I'd probably have to, I have to find it. The easy way is to, is to do a search for implementation um, and find it that way. And we'll put links, when you get a link for this, um, we'll put links uh, to the, those pages um, with the summary of the, um, of the rec and the recording. Yeah, I can send that, send that afterward. I'd Great. Like to That's do, all I'd like to add. Thanks, Barry. I'd like to do a few housekeeping details. Uh, the webinar is scheduled to last an hour and a half. We started at 10 o'clock and will conclude at 11.30. And please note that all of the attendees are muted except for the presenters. Uh, please be aware that we are recording this webinar, and it will be available on the CalSoc website soon. And we'll send links to how to get to uh, both the webinars and the um, evidence-based 
um, practice symposium and resource guide. Um, we have allowed for questions and answers, and we'll have a few natural breaks in the presentation. Um, when you have questions, I will ask that you please type them in the chat box because I will be monitor monitoring it during the presentation. At the conclusion of this webinar, we'll send out an online evaluation and would appreciate uh, your feedback because it's very helpful as we continue our, our planning efforts. And for those of you who are seeking CEUs, I'll follow up with you after the webinar by sending a certificate. Um, and so now on to the presentation. I have the honor of introducing our um, two experts in the field. Our first presenter is Dean Fixen. Dean is the co-author of Implementation Science, a Synthesis of the Literature. He has served on numerous editorial boards and has advised federal, state, and local governments. Dean is a senior scientist at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is co-director of the National Implementation Research Network. He's also co-director of the State Implementation and Scaling Up of Evidence-Based Practices the CSIP Center. He's co-founder of the Global Implementation Initiative and a member of the founding board of editors of the Journal of Implementation Science. Dean has spent his career developing and implementing evidence-based programs, initiating and managing change processes in provider organizations and service delivery systems, and working with others to improve the lives of children, families, and adults. Uh, Dr. Sonia Schoenwald, excuse me, Dr. Sonia Schoenwald, is Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Medical University of South Carolina and was the first Associate Director of the Family Services Research Center there from 1994 until 2004. She pioneered research on transportability and implementation of multisystemic therapy, um, MST, and she is an investigator in federally and foundation-funded research centers and projects about implementation of effective psychosocial interventions in mental health, child welfare, and education systems. Dr. Schoenwald has co-authored four books and numerous peer-reviewed research articles, invited chapters, and monographs. She collaborates with researchers, policymakers, practitioners, consumer advocates, and children and families to advance the science and practice of the implementation of effective treatments and services. So now I would turn it over to them, and I believe Dean is first. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introductions, and <clears throat> thank you uh, all for the uh, invitation to uh, present on the webinar today. This is uh, uh, quite a privilege and, uh, for us, and uh, my task is to tell you a little bit about the what and the why of uh, Fidelity, uh, and then Sonia will provide the uh, bulk of the information about the ins and outs of Fidelity assessment and and how that is uh, used in research and practice. So, uh, and I, well, I love the, the title that uh, Sonia came up with, The Real Meaning of Fidelity and Implementation Science. So it's, uh, I think, uh, as uh, uh, Stuart uh, said, that there's uh, a debate about what is fidelity, uh, how do we assess it, should, should it be assessed at all, uh, and if it is, how do we use it? So, to say that these issues are settled would be uh, a mistake. So part of what we would like to do today is just to lay out some of the uh, information uh, around fidelity uh, to let you know kind of where, what is the status of the, of the field. So part of uh, fidelity, though, has to do with the fundamental truth about implementation, implementation science, and that is people cannot benefit from innovations they do not receive. So uh, for those of you who know me, that you know I'm an old guy, so I've been around a while. And, and the, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, it was pretty clear that uh, huge amounts of money were being invested, uh, huge amounts for that day, uh, in um, various innovations and various fields, uh, all part of the great society programs. Um, but the, uh, the program evaluation data from, the, from those days uh, indicated that very few of these uh, uh, um, programs were actually being used in practice. So uh, Dobbs, uh, the Cook and uh, Dobson and Cook uh, 1980 uh, <laughs> reference is one that we use often. It says uh, that people back in those days were trying to evaluate programs, but in fact, and finding that they weren't working, but in fact, uh, 
the programs weren't even being used. And so implementation kind of grew out of all of that. But the fact that people cannot benefit from innovations they don't experience then kind of begs the question, how do we know that the innovations are there and that people have an opportunity to experience them? And that pertains to fidelity. Uh, we like the uh, Sonia's uh, uh, definition, shown Walt Garland. Ther therapist adherence refers to the extent to which treatments as delivered, treatments as delivered, so this treatments uh, as they're being used in practice, include, and this is important, prescribed components, and they omit proscribed ones. So this definition, uh, simple sentence, um, makes it very difficult though for people who are trying to assess fidelity uh, because you need to know something about what is the treatment, how do you assess that treatment in practice so that you can know the extent to which the treatment is delivered, uh, and then you need to know what are the uh, components that should be there and what are some of the, some of the components that should not be there. Uh, there are examples in the literature now where uh, there's high fidelity use uh, of, of an intervention as intended um, for part of a session, part of a therapy session, for example. But the other part of the therapy session is really a lot of uh, activities that uh, take away all the advantage of the evidence-based program. So on the one hand, the therapist is doing things with high fidelity, but doing the rest of the session uh, in a way uh, that would be proscribed. Uh, very few definitions of fidelity have the proscribed part of this covered. But this definition is a, uh, an excellent one uh, and one that we should uh, aspire to, uh, to uh, meet those conditions. So where are we in the field? Right now, uh, there's been, since 1991, Monker and Prince and all the way through, uh, uh, well, actually more recent than Dudelac and Dupree in 2008, but people have been looking at outcome studies to see what is the outcome, uh, uh, an outcome of, what is the intervention, what is the program or practice. And it turns out in a studies, uh, summaries of studies of about 1,200 of these outcome studies that only 18% even assessed the independent variable. So one out of five times we have some uh, pretty good idea of what the intervention itself is. And only about 7% linked those essential components that uh, were, uh, that define the independent variable uh, to outcomes. So even for uh, those uh, one in five studies that actually measured uh, the independent variable to know that uh, it was there, uh, only a subset of those actually used that assessment when analyzing the outcome data. So that leaves us as practitioners, as policymakers, as people, uh, many of you represented here on the phone, wondering what, what really is this intervention that we uh, admire the uh, outcomes of? Uh, how would we do it again and again? And from an implementation point of view, how repeatable an intervention is, of course, is the key. Uh, it's not sufficient to do this with a few teachers in a few classrooms or a few child welfare workers in a county, we need to have this be done hundreds and thousands of times over. So uh, knowing what it is, knowing what the intervention is, is a critical part of it. And of course, knowing what those essential components are really informs uh, any kind of a fidelity assessment. Here's a study, uh, one of the few uh, that has really looked at implementation variables as a part of a program evaluation uh, effort. Uh, this is done by uh, uh, folks at the RAND Corporation uh, there in California. But on the left-hand side, uh, then these are comprehensive school reforms. There were uh, four or five of these that were on a pick list, uh, and all four or five of the uh, comprehensive school reforms uh, had many randomized control trials and lots of data to support their effectiveness. But when the RAND folks looked at this, they found that when people were doing the research originally, uh, every teacher was being trained, every teacher had continuous support like coaching and, and excellent supervision. But when they started to look then to see 
uh, where in these 8,000 schools that had chosen to do one uh, of these uh, comprehensive school reforms, what happened? And as you see here, fewer than half of the teachers received some training in practice, and fewer than 25% of those got any kind of coaching or follow-up support. And consequently, by the end of the uh, study, fewer than 10% of the schools used the comprehensive school reform, the evidence-based practice, as intended. So here we are again, the vast majority of students didn't benefit. They couldn't benefit from interventions that they did not experience. So we're right back to slide one. Uh, now this is done in 8,000 schools, uh, cost of $2 billion, so this is our tax dollars at work. But we should celebrate these data. Uh, this is a fantastic data set. Uh, any of you have seen us present, we present this uh, many times over. Uh, because this is a terrific example of why we need to be paying attention to fidelity. Uh, and if we want to achieve fidelity, we need to also be paying attention to uh, how we produce it in practice, which is the implementation science part of this. Another excellent example uh, comes from the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, um, WISIP, uh, in, well, the graphics here are a little bit off, uh, but uh, you get the idea here. Down the left-hand side, 1 through 25 were individual therapists. And then you see the uh, recidivism rates for their individual caseloads. So therapists number 1 and 2, uh, in their caseloads, they had zero uh, of their kids uh, recidivating. Uh, for uh, number 25, uh, it was 50% of that caseload uh, where the kids uh, were recidivating. So, uh, but the, the uh, WISIP folks also then uh, made use of the fidelity assessment available for FFT. And as you can see, for the above fidelity uh, therapist, uh, those 12 therapists, uh, they dealt with 204 families and had 13% recidivism, which is, compares favorably to the 22% for the control group that you see the gold stripe down the middle. But look at the below fidelity criteria. Here it's 28% recidivism for those 223 families. So, uh, so actually recidivism, uh, the outcomes there were worse than the control group. Control group at 22%, here it's 28%. So the point here is that, that uh, fidelity really is an important uh, piece of this. Uh, if you take the overall average for all of the FFT therapists compared to the control group, the conclusion is FFT is ineffective. But in fact, when you look at this chart, it's pretty clear that FFT done well is quite effective. FFT done poorly is not effective. So uh, fidelity is a very important part of uh, how we need to assess uh, program outcomes. If we don't know fidelity, it makes it very difficult to know how to interpret the outcomes we're getting uh, in research. Here's another example, uh, dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, this was a, a study where they were looking at, uh, at the impact of DBT uh, uh, on drug use. And you hear, see here data on clean uh, urinalyses. And low fidelity therapists uh, had about 30% uh, clean uh, of their clients with clean urinalyses, and uh, with the high fidelity folks, it was about 80%. So here, it's the same program, DBT, just like we saw for FFT in the prior chart. Uh, so it's not about the, uh, the intervention per se, it's how well the intervention is being used in practice. How do we know how well an intervention is being used in practice? We know that by having a good measure of fidelity, one that meets, meets Sonia's uh, definition. So fidelity, as we have looked at this uh, over uh, many years and many uh, studies, uh, we can boil things down uh, into this uh, fairly simple little three by three chart. The fidelity assessments have to do with context, content, and competence. Context uh, are those things that are uh, necessary just to have the intervention there at all. So you have trained staff who have 
office space who have, I mean, you, you kind of get the idea. And I'll have an example for you in the next slide. Content has to do with the parts of the intervention that need to be there uh, to, uh, to meet the definition of, of the evidence-based program. So how many sessions, of what length, uh, the, uh, uh, is it the right uh, population uh, that you're dealing with, with the inclusion exclusion criteria being met, those kinds of things fit in uh, with the content. Competence has to do with uh, how well that content is uh, delivered. So pacing and tone of voice and uh, therapist uh, 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 body language and uh, all of those kinds of things really start to enter into the picture. Clinical judgment uh, is a, an important part of that, as we know, <clears throat> in human services. So context content competence is what we're looking for. How do we look uh, at that in a fidelity uh, mode? Uh, direct observation uh, is one way where we uh, have uh, uh, either people who are observing live um, uh, the therapy session or the work that is being done by the therapist, <clears throat> uh, or they have audio or visual uh, or videotapes, which are also fairly common these days. Record reviews is another way. Uh, Therapy done well, uh, evidence-based approaches done well, uh, have artifacts associated with them. So in the files, you can find uh, both context, or context content and confidence uh, examples. Asking others, whether this is a consumer evaluation or a survey of uh, people who are closely aligned with therapists and practitioners, uh, but there's a variety of ways where you can ask others about uh, the uh, context, content, and competence. So in the direct observation of competence there it says this is the prize. Uh, this is where, and it's the prize because this is where the, the fidelity uh, assessment leads to many good things. Not only are you observing what the therapist is doing or what the practitioner is doing uh, in a real life setting, you're seeing all of the other contextual things going on. So as a fidelity assessor, part of what you're looking for is not only uh, is this person doing things uh, uh, in a way that uh, uh, conforms with the, uh, the items on the fidelity assessment, but you're also looking at, well, what else is happening here that might influence that one way or the other? So it's out of that direct observation then that uh, interventions get revised and refined and improved uh, it's where uh, fidelity assessments get revised, refined, and approved. Uh, many things come from that direct observation. So that, uh, but that takes the most time, the most effort. Achieving inner observer, high levels of inner observer agreement uh, takes more uh, training, et cetera. But, uh, but we find that that is where most of the learning uh, really occurs. Uh, interesting, when uh, Sonia and, and her colleagues looked at uh, 249 uh, measures of fidelity that they found in the literature review, 71% uh, of those uh, had a direct observation component. Uh, so the, uh, so the uh, emphasis in the field is in the right place, uh, we think. So what about fidelity? Here's a, an example of context content competence. This is from a a, uh, an education example, but you can see where these things would apply. But context, you can directly observe, for example, the organization of materials and groupings in a classroom, or you can look in a file to see the lesson plans and, and what, uh, what the intentions were of the teacher, uh, or you can also uh, ask others. You can interview the curriculum instruction lead uh, for that group of teachers. Uh, for competence, direct observation, uh, think, how, how do teachers engage students? Uh, how do they ask questions, provide information? Uh, do they provide prompt and accurate feedback? Uh, that's very difficult to get anywhere except through uh, direct observation. But that's where the competence part uh, really comes into play. The, the final thing is the how are fidelity data used? And I think in uh, Sonia's uh, work and, and our own work that uh, for 
we discovered that about half or more of all fidelity assessments are done in a research context uh, where uh, it is there to uh, demonstrate that, in fact, uh, the independent variable is there. So that's part of those 18% that we talked about uh, earlier. But in practice, in implementation, where we really want to, uh, to make things better um, and do things well again and again and again, uh, fidelity really is used uh, not only to uh, determine the extent to which uh, the intervention is there, it's also used in a diagnostic way. And that's what's really outlined in this chart. So if you have uh, good outcomes or poor outcomes, you have high or low fidelity uh, or no assessment of fidelity at all, uh, it leads you to do different things. This, this chart, uh, by the way, has, uh, is really uh, uh, something that really gets the attention of policymakers and, uh, and system uh, directors because this is a way for them to use their scarce resources in a more uh, focused way. Uh, when things are not going well, when you have poor outcomes, why is that? What can we do about it? Where should we direct our attention? And that's where this chart has uh, caught their attention. But if you have good outcomes and high fidelity, uh, you want high fidelity to be highly associated with those good outcomes, so uh, that's where you, you celebrate. You, you go have your... Uh, your vanilla latte and uh, or whatever it is you, you no know, that's right California you guys can go have a fish taco and celebrate uh, the fact that you have achieved uh, this high standard. The the next best quadrant uh, or next best cell in this uh, chart though is high fidelity and poor outcomes because here you are doing the intervention as intended you're doing just what you thought was going to be effective but it's, uh, you're finding that it's not effective. But that is wonderful information to have. Now you know, stop doing that. Select a new intervention. Revise the intervention that you have. Uh, find some way of, of, uh, of getting this uh, so that uh, you're actually doing an intervention that is effective. So, uh, so that's a good one. Low fidelity, uh, now things get a little murkier. You have low fidelity and good outcomes. Well, have you really defined the uh, essential components of the intervention? Um, because that's really the basis of the fidelity measure. Or maybe you just have a very poor fidelity assessment. So you're kind of in a quandary there, but at least you know uh, where to start looking uh, in terms of, of a definition of the intervention and how you're assessing that in practice. Low fidelity and poor outcomes, which unfortunately is uh, says a uh, a lot about uh, uh, many of our typical services, it's time to start over. So uh, we don't know uh, much about uh, anything at that point. So, and if we don't have an assessment of fidelity, then we have no guidance system, which is we know outcomes, but we have nothing to attribute those outcomes to. And we don't have guidance then for uh, making any kind of corrective action. So. Fidelity, uh, why do we want to do this? We want to do this because it matters. It matters in terms of getting interventions delivered uh, to children, families, uh, adults in ways that uh, are intended to be beneficial. And it matters in terms of directing our attention to those things uh, that might help on the improvement side. Uh, so uh, we think fidelity is where rhetoric uh, meets reality. And we have a lot of rhetoric uh, that is there, uh, much, much of it lodged in uh, federal and state legislation and requirements. Uh, but none of that matters so much if it does not impact how practitioners uh, interact with children, families, and uh, individuals. So uh, we need to uh, assess fidelity so we know what is being delivered. We know what the adults are doing when they're uh, trying to interact with children. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, we're going to turn it over to Sonia. Thank you. And um, this is Sonia. And I am going to pause for just a moment uh, before I say 
thank you to all of you and to Dean to, to check in with Savan about whether there are questions for Dean that have come in um, that you would like um, for him to take an opportunity to address. I'm assuming they're going to be for him and not for me at this point. But um, Savan, are we, is this a good time to take a break to see what folks have to say? Sure. Um, I'd like to um, encourage the folks on the um, webinar to type questions in the chat box if, in fact, you do have questions for Dean. This is a good opportunity to do that. So, um, Sonia, why don't we wait maybe one or two minutes um, for folks to type something in the chat box. Oh. All right. Okay, here's one. Um, are there any validated self-report skills on Fidelity? Um, you know, Sonia is going to be in a better position to answer that than I am. I know there are validated self-report scales, um, but uh, from uh, what I know, there aren't many. But Sonia, what? what I will. You... I will talk about that a little bit subsequently. Okay. So this is a person clearly that we paid to ask this question, so that that would be something relevant I could add to what Dean has just said. So we'll wait for that one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Great, thanks. Okay, yeah, not any, not not yet. So, if there are questions, please type them in the chat box, and we can ask uh, Dean and, and Sonia. So, Sonia, and I'll Sonia? pause at a couple of different times during my portion of this presentation because, at least from my perspective, there are some sort of natural breaks before moving from one subtopic to another. So there's no need to wait till the end. Um, so I am, uh, like Dean, very, very thrilled to be here, very grateful for the invitation, and very delighted to be able to do this with Dean. He and I do, I think, have a mutual admiration society, and it's always a pleasure to be uh, on the same podium, real or virtual, um, with him. And um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do next is to uh, sort of elaborate a bit on how it is that we might actually uh, get this rhetoric to meet reality through the sort of um, plodding sometimes process of figuring out you know, what to measure and how to measure it in a way that we can all know that it's, that it's uh, reliable and valid and also meaningful to us. So, um, uh, Dean has already actually covered this without perhaps knowing it. He's answered this question about when are uh, pornography and human services alike by providing for you the different boxes of uh, high fidelity, low fidelity, high outcomes, low outcomes, and concluding that we can't really know what it is that we have implemented much less whether it works unless we have that combination of measuring the implementation, fidelity, and the outcomes. Um, but in a, in a little commentary I was asked to write in a review of fidelity measurements and fidelity measurement systems that have been used in mental health services, um, I uh, wrote a little commentary called, It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Fidelity Measurement in the Real World, and opened that little piece by um, referring to this case um, that uh, w went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1964 in which a movie theater in Ohio had shown a film that some had taken to uh, interpret as pornography and that others had not. And I we have all probably heard and perhaps even used this phrase, I know it when I see it. Um, it's, it's made it to Wikipedia, a colloquial expression by which the user attempts to categorize an observable fact or event, although that category is subjective or lacks clearly defined parameters. And um, as Dean has already uh, portended for you all, the problem for us about this um, with respect to human services is that um, when we basically sort of try to trust that we know what the thing is we are trying to deliver to a consumer, or and that consumer can be a consumer of a service, or a professional who is a consumer of a training or workshop or CEU kind of program, um, then what happens is it's hard for us to answer the question, for example, of a referral agent or a policymaker or the consumer 
um, the question, well, did I get it? Did I get what I paid for? And if the answer is, well, I don't know, it depends on if you ask the client or if you ask the clinician or if you ask the payer, then we have a problem. And so um, the, the, we, we're, we're trying to move our human services in order to know what they are and which variety of services are most effective for which target populations. We need to be able to get beyond, well, I know it when I see it. And fidelity uh, of implementation is one way to get there. Um, but to do that, we actually have to be able to do a reasonably good job of defining and measuring fidelity. Dean has already talked a bit about um, the fact that fidelity is a multi-component kind of or multi-dimensional construct. And um, I'll be talking about that for the next couple of slides. What I'm going to do now is to begin by talking about the way that fidelity measurement has been going on in, in psychotherapy research over the last 30 years or so. Dean started us in about the 1980s when he was talking about programs that were social programs that were being um, promulgated uh, in the hopes of helping a wide swath of folks with a wide variety of problems. Um, and at about that same time, fidelity measurement really began to make it into the psychotherapy research. Uh, that is pr primarily research looking, uh, randomized trials looking at the outcomes of a particular psychotherapy that had been developed relative to a control condition, and also some psychotherapy process research trying to get a handle of what's happening in sessions that might be leading to the outcomes. But primarily in the research from the 1980s through this decade, the fidelity measurement in psychotherapy research was, as Dean has mentioned, a check on manipulation of the independent variable. Um, that is to say, here's my experimental treatment, or you know, in, in a drug trial, here's my psycho, psychotropic medication. Um, and it's really that that's being implemented in this randomized trial testing and effect, not something else. Dean has already um, provided you with a, a, a much prettier chart than these two bullet points reflect about the different methods for identifying and measuring fidelity in these psychotherapy studies, the direct observational approach um, and indirect approaches, and the, the ask others approach, which could be ask the person doing the thing, ask the person receiving the thing, asking somebody else who's an expert on the thing, and doing a third-party review of case notes. There we go. With respect to this notion of, of defining fidelity, there are actually distinct dimensions that have been identified and for which uh, sort of psychometric and statistical analyses has confirmed sort of differences. One is adherence, and, and Dean did the favor. I really didn't, by the way, pay him to use, to use you know, research that Ann Garland and I had done or definitions that we've crafted. Um, but the uh, adherence is evidence that th therapy occurred as intended, um, and as intended means the prescribed, the, the things that were supposed to happen happened, and the things that were not supposed to happen didn't happen. Um, differentiation is a dimension of fidelity that says, was it treatment A or treatment B? Sometimes there are fine shades of distinctions in the way two different treatments are defined and specified and the way that they train people. Sometimes uh, to use them, sometimes those, those, um, those kinds of distinctions are, are, are very different. So for example, in psychotherapy, um, psychodynamic treatment approaches or a psychodynamic approach to treating an individual adult would look fairly different on a number of observable dimensions from uh, cognitive behavioral treatment for an adult with a particular disorder. And so being able to tell the difference on the basis of um, an adherence measurement of a fidelity measure is what differentiation is about. Competence, as Dean has already alluded to, has to do with how well is the thing implemented. Um, but well is kind of a pornographic term also because it can be pretty subjective. You know, did I do it when I, when I, you know, my idea of my playing tennis pretty well is pretty different from the idea of playing tennis well that um, my, you know, the, the folks who actually are, are competing on the circuit would have, even of my performance. And so in the research between 1980 and, and 2008 that we reviewed, um, as, as I'll present in a subsequent slide, 
competence uh, has been, sometimes it had been measured on scale sort of, of take this element. So did, um, did behavioral rehearsal occur at all? That would have been the answer to that is an adherence answer, yes or no. Um, how well did that therapist do behavioral rehearsal um, would be uh, a competence question. There are still, uh, that is a very evolving kind of construct, at least within psychosocial intervention, psychotherapy research for mental health, behavioral health issues, with some folks like um, Bryce McLeod and Michael Southam Jarreau and his colleagues and Anne Garland and her colleagues in San Diego and others trying to see if they can get a handle at whether it means how thoroughly does something happen or how intensively does that happen and is that the same thing as how well it happens? And the answer right now is it's an open question and, and there's research going on um, taking a look at the implementation of specific evidence-based treatments to see if we can better define what's really competent and not. And the reason we care is because we want to see whether there's a relationship between competence and outcomes, adherence and competence, um, and what those relationships are. And I'll talk a little bit about the particular study examples where folks are trying to so sort that out uh, further toward the end of this presentation. Of all of these uh, different dimensions of fidelity, adherence has been the one that has been by far the most frequently measured in the psychotherapy research. And as Dean described earlier, even so, it's only been uh, looked at in about one in five different one in studies about one in five different treatments. So it's not happening very often. Um, we wanted to get a handle, Ann Garland and her colleagues and I, on um, just how often is it being measured and is it being measured in ways that really could be useful to practice contexts because we are now coming into a world in which implementation fidelity is getting its due. People are understanding that there's a difference between saying you're going to adopt a particular teaching program or drug treatment program or psychotherapy or even health practice, like uh, yeah, making sure there's no needle sharing, for example, um, saying you're going to adopt it and actually implementing it well. And so we wanted to see if we could get a handle on the array of different types of measures people are using, at least in the psychotherapy research, to get a handle on adherence, and also then to see what we could learn about the clinical context in which those instruments were being used so that we could get a handle on how much raw material is there out there that we might be able to recommend to practitioners and service organizations uh, using um, implementation or, or fidelity adherence, adherence um, specifically adherence uh, measurements as they're trying to see whether they're implementing as intended a particular treatment they uh, wish to deliver to their clients. So we looked at what we found in this comprehensive review. Um, I'll just give you a smattering of the findings here. Um, to make a, a basic point. As, as Dean's already said, there were about 72% of the instruments that had been used and published uh, and, and that we could find in the published research were observational, meaning someone else watched. There was high reliability. That is, it was not a pornography question. Five people could look at it and say with very high reliability, yes, that is a tiger. It is not an elephant, essentially. Um, 59% of the instruments were used to assess different types of cognitive behavioral therapy um, across all of the measurement methods, not just for CBT though, about 55% of them, so just over half were only used in a single study, um, which suggests that, you know, that, that on the one hand the glass half full means, well, at least almost half of them were used in a couple of different studies to look at implementation in a couple of different contexts. So maybe there is something there that we can use in a practice context. Um, the, there, there was stunning to us though to find out that, that actual psychometric properties, evidence about is this a reliable thing? Is it measuring the thing you mean it to measure? Is that, is it, um, does it hold up as something anybody could use and get the same result? were actually only reported in these articles for about a third of the measures. Um, I'm going to come back to why that might be the case. The good news, though, was about a third of these were used in community-based practice settings with the kinds of professionals that you would find in those settings. So um, social workers, family therapists, master's level counselors. Um, it, it would have been nice to see that the majority of the 
the measures were used with those kinds of folks and in those kinds of contexts. But at least a third of them were, um, which suggests that there is, is, uh, is some utility for the kind of workforce that we have in the practice world um, that is often distinct from the workforce of psychologists or psychiatrists who might be initially testing a particular treatment in the context of a university-based randomized trial. Um, Dean has already alluded earlier to the fact though, that, um, that the connection between adherence and outcomes are reported um, for relatively few of the instruments, only about 10% of them. Um, I want to say something briefly about how I think this is going to change in the next few years so that all of us who are trying to work at the interface of practice and research and policy will be able to take heart about some progress, and that is that I think part of why we found so little in the literature about these details um, on uh, psychometric properties and also on what kind of training did it take to get people to do the fidelity measurement, what did it cost to do that training, it is in part a function of editorial policies of the kinds of peer-reviewed journals that these studies get published in. And, and there was for a long time such a premium on you get a certain number of pages, you have to describe the treatment, the measurement methodology, the data analyses, and the results. And if you're five lines over, they send it back to you and say, get rid of more text. So part of it is that there was not a requirement, there was no space to sort of then describe anything beyond the basic, yes, we trained the coders, there were this many of them, it took this many hours. That is now changing with a number of the sort of top tier journals having rewritten editorial policies several years ago to say, if you are implementing, if, you're, if you are sending us a study in which you're reporting on implementing a particular intervention, you need to give us the information that you know it was the intervention, and if you tell us there was fidelity, you have to tell us how you measured it, what the results of the measurement were, so that would speak to the psychometric properties being required. Um, and, um, and what it linked to, and if it's too long to fit into the major, you know, major article, you can put it in an appendix or put it online. So I think the good news for those of us who are trying to call the research for evidence that there could be useful tools for practice and, and, and policy and implementation, we'll be able to find more of that information in the next few years than we have been able to find in the last 30 years. We were also curious then to take a look at some of this since there were so many different kinds of measurement methods. Um, you know, so if somebody says, well, are there actually adherence measurement methods? Yep, 249 of them just for psychotherapy studies since 1980. Um, but they, they, we wanted to get a better handle on whether there were similarities, core similarities across measurement methods that we might be able to capitalize on. To, uh, to help folks design measurement methods that could be valid and parsimonious and used in the real world. So what we did is we, in a separate article, we took 53 of the articles from that original pool that were reporting on studies of evidence-based treatments for youth with disruptive behavior disorders just to see if we could, within one class of treatments for one class of problem that is a fairly high-frequency problem with kids, identify you know, how many of those had measurement methods for adherence and were there any commonalities among them. And just to give you a flavor of things, we did find that for the 14 treatments, there were 11 uh, adherence measures, and we were able to obtain nine of those from the developers of the treatments or the people who had done the testing of the treatments. Um, across those nine, we found 3,521 distinct items and depending on the treatment in question, there was one adherence measurement method that had four items and another one that had 1,733. And the level of detail in those items ranged just very dramatically from such things as set the context for the play session to introduce the purple puppet to the child. And the reason I'm raising that here is because um, we, were, we were at the end not able to find even sort of commonalities in the ways that context or specific clinical procedures or even who was the target of the intervention, the extent to which a session was the caregiver or parent, the child, both of those people, the whole family, and so on. And so this is not um, it, it does mean that sort of finding a, a, a common approach to or, or common content would be hard to do across different treatment models based on adherence measurement methods. But it also speaks to the fact that 
for any particular treatment model or child welfare intervention program or teacher training or pedagogical kind of approach, the way that that approach has been defined and specified should logically link to the way you check for adherence to that method. So if, in fact, um, all you need to do is to um, put up a dispenser for hand washing for the, that alcohol-based gel rub, um, you know, every X number of feet of corridor in a hospital, then your adherence measurement to did you implement that safety and health um, um, and sanitary practice is pretty straightforward. You know, you measure, can you, can you see the, the dispenser? Is it the right number of yards apart? Does it have the gel in it? On the other hand, if you're trying to describe um, what adherence to a particular hip replacement procedure is, you are going to look, there is a larger number of prescribed elements you have to look for, and there are also probably some proscribed elements you have to look for. So it is sort of logical that the way that the nature and the complexity of a particular intervention method would then drive what the adherence measurement method detail looks like for that method. Um, and so part of our challenge will be for more complex kinds of treatments or interventions or teaching programs, how can you capture the phenomenon clearly enough in a way that it is reliable, but also with uh, enough practicality that you can do it in the real world, and that is um, where I'm going to take us next. So we had this 30 years or more of, of looking at fidelity, at least in the psychotherapy literature and some of the other social program literature that Dean described, mostly to see did we test in our outcomes clinical trial the thing we thought we were testing. If we thought we were checking out, you know, tigers, did we, were we, were, did we have tigers in the room rather than elephants? Um, we have within the last decade of greater um, policy um, and consumer ag advocacy and, and research uh, kind of efforts come to a point of recognizing that we now care about fidelity measurement for reasons other than the independent variable check in a randomized trial. Some of those reasons are pretty high stakes purposes. By high stakes meaning you know, immediate and apparent impact on the end users of the intervention, patients in hospitals, clients in mental health clinics, children in classrooms. Um, also high stakes purposes for those who are doing the intervention, in other words, the professional or paraprofessional or uh, peer consumer guide who is or is not going to have a job uh, based on some of the decisions that are made um, by by consumers and policymakers and payers. So high stakes purposes have, have you know, pretty immediate measurable impact on the clients or the interveners. Um, and some examples are that there are some service systems, um, mental health service systems, juvenile justice systems that are making decisions about which array of treatments and services are going to be made available based on um, not only that the contract that they wrote with a particular provider says, you know, yes, we are paying you to do trauma-focused cognitive behavioral treatment with children referred from child welfare with trauma symptoms, but who then are also going to saying, and we want evidence that you actually implemented. We know you say you've adopted it. We know you say you got the training. Give us the documentation you did that. But now we want to see that you really implemented it with those clients for whom it was appropriate. Um, and if you don't, Several things could happen. You know, you could, um, we will we'll take the, con we'll end the contract, or we will, if you can identify fidelity at the level of a particular individual clinician, once you've given them an opportunity to retrain, you may or may not be able to keep that person on, and so on. So that's high stakes. Lower stakes purposes are things like helping to train folks up in a new thing, but not necessarily requiring that they do it at a certain level or get fired and for the purposes of providing folks performance feedback. Performance feedback, um, ah, before I get to performance feedback, so um, the next few slides I will talk a little bit more about the whole business now that sort of often sounds terribly boring, which is about actually now trying to measure this thing, these different dimensions of fidelity, and seeing how they connect to outcomes. And um, I think we've probably all heard this since grade school, if not before, you get what you measure. 
Um, and in this case, we, the high stakes purposes would be you get what you measure and, and you get what you pay for. Um, measurement tends to focus the attention and behavior and resources. Um, so there are examples, JCAHO for hospital accreditation, all the doctors and, and uh, paraprofessionals and those of us at the medical university know that that is coming and we get all kinds of memos about what we need to make sure we've done before that accreditation. No Child Left Behind was another example of focusing um, education systems, teachers, families, policymakers on, uh, on getting certain kinds of test scores. There are great examples in child welfare systems about what they are required to report in terms of number of times a child or family has been seen, a couple of other things. At the same time, there can be potentially perverse effects of this, right? So there are folks who talk about No Child Left Behind as really now being so focused on testing that that's all they do, and what you've got is No Child Left Untested. In child welfare, there are some great uh, uh, descriptions that Charles Glisson and his colleagues have provided when they were trying to do some randomized trials to help child welfare systems to implement evidence-based treatments, and even just to use organizational practices that would enable uh, child welfare workers to focus more on children and families and outcomes. And one of the things that they were told repeatedly in one of the large-scale studies in Tennessee is that those people could not do this because they were required to do certain kinds of paperwork that measured things that were, you know, like how the timing in which you had, had done your paperwork and how many copies you had made. And um, they, they were all things that essentially detracted from being able to focus on the child and family. So you get what you measure. If you know somebody's going to come after you to produce something, that's the thing we tend to do. Um, I want to mention for a moment um, that measuring fidelity is not the same thing, of what, same thing as what we might do to establish or maintain fidelity. So we might need to train and provide clinical supervision or consultation, either peer or expert consultation. Master teachers in classrooms are an example of that. We might need to do coaching or a combination of those things. Um, I've done a much longer talk at the Global Implementation Con Conference about what are the things we know from research about which of those things might be helpful for whom in what combination, and I'm not going to do that here today. Um, that said, Having these instrumentation, having measurement of fidelity um, can be useful in designing um, approaches to support the actual implementation fidelity. So you have to have valid measures from which you can trust the outcomes, the feedback you get from the measures, the scores, and then feed those back to interveners and systems and see if you can improve their performance. And there's a long history of this in healthcare. Um, there are these things called audit and feedback systems in which you tell a physician there have been evidence-based guidelines for medicine since the early 90s. Um, there were always from pharmaceutical companies sort of uh, instructions about how much of a medication you used for a person of a particular weight and so on. And what these studies did in very nice randomized trials was to demonstrate that if you could show the physicians how they stacked up along with, with the performance of their particular procedure or prescribing behavior against what the, the guideline, the evidence-based guideline said, that you could change their behavior simply by showing them that feedback. You know, it says you're supposed to do this many milligrams at the, at, for this kind of weight and you're using too few, and that if you give them that feedback in some array that makes sense to them, they will change their behavior, and it's particularly effective with those, adhi those physicians who are low adhering. So for the people who were already adhering pretty well, it didn't matter if they got the feedback, but for the ones who weren't, it made a whole lot of difference. There have been efforts to do this increasingly in behavioral health. John Lockman and his colleagues have a nice example from their coping power intervention in school in their large field-based studies where they found that by being able to give the implementers who were combinations of teachers and school-based personnel feedback, they got up from the fidelity measurement they did with observational measures. Those folks had better fidelity and those kids had better outcomes. Um, Len Bickman and his colleagues are doing similar kinds of things with outpatient mental health services. So there are inklings now that this, which has been happening in healthcare for some time, this business of getting accurate feedback and just giving the feedback to the folks doing the intervening can be an effective way to get them to do the thing more effectively with greater adherence and affect client or patient outcomes. What we really are, I think, all hoping to do is to see how we can take that feedback that from the sort of practitioner level 
and, and implement it in a more systemic approach in which we could basically um, do what my colleagues, Mike McLeod, I mean Bryce McLeod and, and, and Mike Southam Drew and others have recently written about, which is to say that um, you could take implementation feedback systems that could help us to support the reach and quality and sustainability of evidence-based treatments. Um, and that integrity, treatment integrity, which is another word for fidelity, is and, and ought to be a quality indicator for mental health care and something that you would put into one of these systems. I'm going to expand on that for just a moment and then take a break for questions. The promise of implementation feedback systems um, is that they help do those things that Dean had in the boxes earlier. They help you to distinguish in, in closer to real time whether it's the intervention itself that is failing, in other words, you're using the intervention as implemented with the correct target population, or whether it is the failure of the implementation. You've got the right target population for the right intervention, but the way you're implementing the intervention is not as prescribed. Um, it helps also to, they, these, these feedback systems could also help us to, to figure out where in Dean's boxes, context, competence, and so on, where is the failure? Where is the thing we need to improve upon? Are there things at the practitioner level, whether that's a teacher, social worker, mental health professional, psychiatrist? Are there specific things we need to help the individual interventionist to do? Is it instead the case that there's something about organizational policies or procedures or the softer sides of, of constructs like implementation, climate, and culture, which although less written in stone than policy or procedure, there are some very nice validated measures of those organizational constructs that are shown to affect implementation and outcomes. And Charles Glisson is one of the people who has designed and tested those measures. Or is the problem more at the service system level? Or is it a combination of those things? One of the gifts and promises of this kind of feedback system is that everybody involved in the implementation could have a shared yardstick of accountability. We can all know what are the items we're trying to measure and that we're trying to see improvement on. And um, we would have a shared definition of those things. And that makes it very different. A shared yardstick of accountability is a very different thing from the pornographic sort of I know it when I see it. Um, the hope is that being able to do this would also support a culture of, of learning organizations. Um, and to do it means we have to get much better at understanding which data are valid and meaningful for which kinds of phenomenon. So if you just, this goes back to you get what you measure. If all you need to know, some things you just need counts. You don't need a validated measure. Did the client come or not? Did the teacher teach the, le was the teacher in class? Did the teacher teach the lesson is a different kind of question because then you have to know something about the content of the lesson. So some things are, are just counts that don't require designing and testing the effectiveness of a measure. Um, other things do require that you actually design a, a measurement method or a measurement tool like one of the 249 that we found in the uh, literature review that we did. Um, and generally speaking, if you want to understand something about the content of a treatment session or the content of a visit between the biological parent and a child who is currently in foster care, or the content of um, a pedagogical technique that a teacher is using, then you have to start to really define what is it you're looking for and testing with some kind of either observational report measure. Can you see it? Can you see how well it's happening? Um, if you want to know something about a treatment program, then you have to figure out, okay, what are the program level parameters versus the, in the intervention level parameters? So program parameters can include things like how many staff you have, whether it's the right mix. So for assertive community treatment, do you have, for adults with, with serious persistent mental illness, is there really a, a, a few hours of a psychiatrist's time and the nurse practitioner and the caseworker? Or do you not have the right mix of personnel? independent from what does that person actually do with a client in the face-to-face -face session. Um, you need to be able, when, if you're looking at, at policies and procedures at the organizational level, you have to be able to know whether they're there. Um, leadership is another construct that actually requires some measurement methodology. There are a variety of measures of leadership available, and Greg Ahrens and his colleagues have looked at uh, which ones seem applicable to trying to get implementation of, of evidence-based services into the, into the realm. Then there's this question that somebody asked earlier, 
um, about who can, it, where that pertains to this, who can provide an accurate report about which indicator. Um, and here the, there, are, uh, there are some interesting studies and findings. I'll show you a couple slides from now. Basically, um, it's, it's, you know, it's easy for a, it, it's, some things are pretty straightforward. So a client can say, yes, I was, I was in my session yesterday and that was my therapist or that was my peer support person. Um, and a therapist can tend to say, yes, the client did or didn't come. The question of, did I then implement behavioral rehearsal? Or did I, uh, in the case of harm reduction techniques, for example, for um, kids at high risk of AIDS involved in, in one study <clears throat> where, there, where there was an intervention test, the answer to the question, was the penis model used in the session, was a question that the parent, the kid, and the therapist all had a different answer to. And it's a pretty straightforward, I'm back to my pornography thing, I just realized, it's a pretty straightforward thing. There either is a model that you learn to put a condom on in the session, or there isn't. It's not like you can sort of have it there. And so there's more evidence that, that, that it's difficult to get really clear, define something in a way that everybody who's seeing it knows what it is, um, and so far the evidence is really quite mixed about the extent to which clinicians can do that uh, accurately. And I'll, I'll show you uh, sort of for which kinds of things does that seem more or less uh, easy for folks to do. A big last point about this, or second to last, is if, if we want to use a feedback system to help maintain or change somebody's behavior, um, on the basis of the feedback they see, then we have to know that the thing we're measuring uh, with our instrument um, actually changes in response to uh, feedback. So one example that we give from our work on multisystemic therapy is there are some therapist adherence measures that caregivers fill out once a month. There are supervisor adherence measures that therapists fill out on supervisors every eight weeks. So if you wanted to use a score from that supervisor adherence measure from yesterday, feed it back to the supervisor today, and see the behavior change tomorrow, you couldn't do it because the measure itself measures phenomena that take place over an eight-week period of weekly group supervision. So we wouldn't expect to see behavior change tomorrow on the basis of giving the supervisor the feedback today. We would expect to see the change over the next eight-week period because it's the weekly meeting over that eight weeks that is reflected in the measurement method. Finally, doing these kinds of systems is going to require um, sort of implementing the systems well themselves, and that's a whole um, new kind of process for some organizations and, and, and practices. Um, and um, I'm actually going to skip that and tell you that my hope is that this can help us all to do it. I actually will say more about this and tools that we can use and studies testing those tools. But I want to break now to see if there are questions about what I've said to you all so far. All right, so let's encourage uh, people to type questions in the chat box. While they are, um, Sonia, I actually had a question um, when you were talking about adherence um, some time ago. We get this question asked a lot, and I want to ask your your opinion about it. Okay, so when there's a new practice that's implemented or a new some type of innovation, um, what is your best advice for selecting the most important factors or components of that practice um, that that speaks to adherence of of the way it should be intended? Did I ask? Did that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I, I mean, I I, I think um, there is a there's a, a piece that I've just, um, I'm the third author on that's now in press with a group that's working with the Annie E. Casey Foundation on trying to help social work practices that are using family decision-making kinds of meetings to see, to, to see if that family decision-making process is in fact helping folks, if people are doing the family decision-making process and if that's having any effect on placement rates of kids. And, and um, the reason that I raise that example is because it is, an, it, 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 is, it is a situation in which this family-based decision-making was sort of an, a notion of family inclusion and empowerment that was 
had some broad, the people who were designing it had some broad ideas about what it would mean. Family should be there, everything should be open, nobody, nothing should be discussed about them without them, which is sort of one of the family advocacy things that Family Federations for Families said years ago. Um, but, the, and so, but they had very, very, you know, di had some idea about what kinds of decisions they should be talking about. But that was it. It was pretty loosely specified. And so one of the things that this group then at Casey asked a couple of folks involved in research, including Sarah Kate Bierman, who's the first author on this paper I'm referring to, to help them with is to say, well, we now want to find out if this is actually working to prevent placement. Um, how do we do that? And, and she and the folks went through all of the kind of materials they use to help social workers and say, well, for one thing, this is so loosely defined that it would be hard to know if it's happening or not because really all you can measure is did you have a meeting with all the right people, you say it has to be the social worker, all the family members, the foster family, and did they discuss decisions? You know, but you don't have anything about how that was supposed to happen. So part of the work she's doing with them is pulling together the social workers and the systems that are using this process to come together and say, okay, what do you think are the hallmark attributes of this thing you call family decision making? Can we get consensus on what you think those are? Let's write them down. Let's give it to the people who you think are doing it and see if they can recognize, yes, this is what they thought family decision making is. And then let's see if we can design and test an instrument to see if that is happening in those meetings. And that's what they're in the process of doing. So it sort of is retrofitting it, it's saying, look, since, since you so loosely defined what this is, but now you need to know, is it working? We need to first help you more clearly define those sentinel elements and then see if we can design a measurement method where the people who are participating in the meetings and are supposed to be the, sort of coaching and facilitating can actually, actually do it and we can measure it. And so I would say that the, the key attributes for adherence are are those things that you, the, the people developing the innovation, you know, um, would say, you know, essentially it requires having a logic model, saying, you know, if, if first a content model, here is what I think my intervention is, here is how I think it is, you know, the same or different from any other intervention, and here are the hallmark things that tell me, yep, this is, this is my thing, this is what I mean, um, and, he, and you have to actually sort of take the time to write that down and then see if you can detect it when someone else is doing it. Um, so that's a, and, and that will vary depending on hand washing to um, you know, family based decision, family decision making in, in foster care to delivering a particular treatment model. Um, so it's hard work, the sort of specification, it really forces you to take the, the chaff and grain and, and take them apart. And um, so I'm going to pause there because that, that if, if that has not gotten into the ballpark of what you wanted to know, um, then I should take a different track. That was good. That helped. That helped. There's another question that I have also, um, and that is, can you briefly explain proscribe components and how they could be measured? Oh, yes. I have a great example. It's so fun. So. Um, this Dean was mentioning earlier about how someone could have high fidelity, uh, therapists could have high fidelity to particular kinds of, uh, let's say, treatment techniques with children um, for part of the session, and then for the rest of the session do things that are you know, not related, but if you only measured that the things they did, you'd say, oh yeah, that was high fidelity, why didn't the kid get better? So a, a, a really, um, two, two fun examples, um, they, they both happen to be from, from mental health. Um, and, and with children. Um, one is that um, back when we were developing the, and testing the implementation protocols for MST, we would listen to these um, multi-systemic therapy, sorry. We would listen to audio tapes of um, clinical supervisors helping therapists with cases, and we would um, see also the sort of specific kind of um, case summaries that were very focused on particular analytic process used in MST and particular principles. And the paper, the, the case summaries looked like, you know, all of the analytic process was there and all of the intervention and assessment processes conformed to the principles of MST. And then we'd listen to the, to the, to the direct observation. So that's another direct observation. It can be audio or video or live observation. Listen, I'd listen to the tape and I would hear that, yes, in fact, 
the clinician, this, this, this therapist, uh, supervisors helping the therapist, was in fact with the family um, helping this caregiver to, um, to, to connect with the parent of a deviant peer, of another, of another delinquent kid. She was using the particular strategies that we had recommended in, in MST to get the parents on the same page about not letting these two kids who like to do drugs and steal things hang out together. And um, there was evidence, sort of measurable evidence, number of times that happened. And then the rest of the conversation was about the therapist going out and just hanging out with the kid, the, this teenager, and taking him to the mall and doing all these things that are highly reinforcing of um, uh, actually, and to the mall where, by the way, other deviant peers were hanging out. And so it completely canceled out helping the parent to keep the kid from deviant peers because the therapist herself was then going to hang out with the teen because what she really likes is hanging out with teens and she wasn't really yet at the place of feeling excited nor skilled enough to understand that working with the caregiver about changing the teen's behavior is going to be where it was at. So we saw the right things. They were the prescribed things to do. And then the rest of the time she was doing things that are directly antithetical to what it takes to get better outcomes with delinquent teens. Um, Anne Garland has, has another one about using therapists using some of the parent management training practices to help parents with younger kids with, with um, disruptive behavior disorders in community-based clinics in San Diego and doing uh, a bit of the parent man specific parent management techniques and then the rest of the time basically letting the parent go and having sort of free-form supportive conversation with the child, which is actually um, not helpful to changing the disruptive behavior. So that, those are some of the kinds of examples of proscribed. They are things that are, that are actually um, in, in a court, the treatment model has specific pathways, mechanisms of action, treatment theory that it says this is, this is how the treatment works, here are the targets the treatment hits, and you do those targets for some of the treatment and then for the, other, the, the rest of the session, you use things that actually are not at all consistent with um, the mechanism of actions or treatment theory. Great. Good enough? Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, all right. I'm going to do a few more, and then we'll uh, leave some more question time and, and say so long, I think. Uh, is that all right for me to get back on the horse here? That sounds great. Okay. So. <clears throat> Um, one of the things about designing dashboards <laughs> is um, just, just because I do, we, we do want to get something concrete out of this, is you can do this in several different ways depending on the nature of the interventions you're trying to implement and the outcomes you're trying to get. So I'm going to go backwards for a second. This is a pretty complicated dashboard that my friend Bruce Jerpita, a friend and colleague who's just a phenomenal and very smart guy, uh, put together for a, a project that we, uh, I was a part of that is the Research Network on Youth Mental Health funded by the MacArthur Foundation, essentially multi-site randomized trials to get a handle on um, implementation of, of evidence-based treatments using different approaches for kids ages 7 to 12. And then we had a suite of other studies about could systems use these things and so on. And he, um, this is just, I won't, I won't try to go through the details. What I do want to say about this was that um, that some of these indicators are just things that you count. So I was saying earlier, some things you don't need a measure for. You can just count. Does the kid get there? Does a certain thing happen? Uh, so um, on the, um, on the left-hand margin here, for example, did I give homework? You know, is a fairly straightforward thing. There's a homework form that the therapist has to give the family. You would know if it happened or didn't. Um, did I do an in vivo practice right there in the session? Um, that's something that we actually then had to watch the observation, listen to the tapes to see if it really happened. Um, some of these kinds of, of measures of progress, um, for example, um, where it says down here, child externalizing, internalizing behaviors, the CBCL, those are actually um, indicators from um, measurement methods that have valid, reliable, where you actually have to give somebody the measurement and have them fill it out. So you can have a road map or an, and, and you, can, you, can, you can drive with information about discrete events that are easy to see that you might not need a measurement method for, or other kinds of behaviors or processes where you really do need to first design or use an existing measurement method. A simpler way to go 
depending on, and the reason, by the way, the reason we needed these is because we were looking for ways to help supervisors to be able to see for every child and family that was being treated by the therapists in the randomized trials, um, from week to week, were they able to implement the very specific techniques, fear ladder and so on, for the kids who had anxiety? Were there other things going, what was the treatment progress with respect to the anxiety symptoms? Um, and were there other events that were going on that were preventing folks from being able to make progress, sort of critical events? Um, and then what did the therapist actually do in the session about what they were supposed to do? And those were trying to get that on a single form where a supervisor and therapist could glance quickly and see when all that's going on, how do we measure what I did and whether the kid's getting better was the objective of this kind of, of, a, of a, a dashboard. Um, if you don't need to do all of that, and really all you need to know today is, okay, is my diaper clean or not? Is my tummy full or not? Do I need a nap or am I high energy? You can have far, more, far, far less complicated kinds of dashboards and, and feedback systems. And so um, these are very concrete, observable kinds of things, the diaper at least. We don't really know from these kids yet whether their tummies are full or someday they'll be able to tell us. Um, so this takes us to the point that – I'm going to just switch, come back to those – that we need to be able to balance the, the complexity of our measurement and the scores that we get out of it and how we can use that in a feedback system against the purpose of the measurement. Right? And so when we talked earlier, we have high stakes purposes, then you need to really know that your measurement is effective, meaning it has good psychometric properties, it's reliable and valid, and it's not one of those things that's pornographic. It is not something that, you can, that we can all agree to disagree, I see it this way, you see it that way. When it's high stakes, we really can't afford to do that if what we want is to get effective treatment services to the clientele in a way that we know they will get better and have evidence that they have gotten better. Um, on the other hand, we also want to be able to do that in a way that is usable in a practice context. Um, and so we, you, it is not entirely clear that you can use the same measurement method, the same instrument for multiple purposes. That's really an empirical question. Um, and so I'll come back to say that what we're trying to do here is to make sure that we bring as much attention to how to construct and test these measurements and within the fidelity measurement realm as we do to designing and testing the treatments. Because if you do the treatments well but you can't measure it or you can't measure accurately how they're being implemented, then we won't be able to get that combination of, of prime, here's the key, the brass ring uh, outcome that Dean had presented in his boxes. Um, so I will... Um, have already essentially said you can't, you, we, we have to actually do this work, and I'll give you a couple of examples now of people who are doing that to see um, basically can you use a measurement method used for one thing to in fact do something else. So from my example earlier about the supervisor adherence measure, can't use a measure with that, that indices things that took place, specific things that happened weekly in group supervision over eight weeks to get a supervisor to change their behavior tomorrow because we can't capture in our supervisor adherence measure whether it did change tomorrow. So we wouldn't be able to use that measure to give people day-to-day -day feedback on how did they do in supervision in the way that the audit and feedback systems with the physicians doing prescribing practices could go to them every day and they could change their practice tomorrow. That's one of those examples of the, the purpose has to, meet, has to match the measurement method. So, there are a variety of folks, colleagues of mine and other folks that I may or may not know well, who are trying now to, to focus research and get research funding to see if we can get more of these um, measurement methods into practice that are both effective, that is they measure what they're supposed to with good psychometric properties, and they work in the real world and can be implemented in the real world. And I think that since you all will have this slide on the web, and I have spoken too long. Um, I will just not run through all of these, but tell you that what's in the slides are a couple of studies of contingency management with adolescents in which we demonstrated 
this discrepancy between, which I'll show you on the next page, between what a parent says happened, what a youth says happens, and what a therapist says happens, and just sort of the, these represent distinct differences in what they saw. And then the expert raters were yet on a completely different page. So there was evidence that this was a phenomenon for which people were not all able to come to consensus about what was delivered. So the next step is what, how do we change the measures so that we can get that consensus, or do we just use one person or another's feedback? Um, we have done, uh, there, is, there is an effort going on in Washington to get a handle on uh, fidelity to supervision for trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy that Shannon Dorsen, Dorsey and her colleagues are using. No results yet. That study is in progress. And I will skip quickly to Patty Chamberlain's work with Lisa Saldana trying to now test essentially uh, a uh, measurement of stages of implementation in the context of a randomized trial about different implementation strategies in which they are also looking to see whether you can actually accurately assess these different stages of implementation. Can system leaders do it? Can practitioners do it? and then they will evaluate the data they get on that measure and see what else it predicts. So I'll stop here um, and apologize in advance for not having implemented my portion of this presentation effectively because I am behind and have not gotten to walk you through all the slides. So um, this is not a good example of fidelity of implementation of an implementation fidelity presentation. I apologize. Okay, um, so there's two minutes left. Um, we will have this presentation online in the PowerPoint slides, so um, if people are interested in it, in it, we will have that. There's one question about um, your audience. Um, Sonia is asking um, who, your, who your audience is for, for the content of this, of this presentation, or the content that you present. Who do you usually present to? What, what kind of audiences do you present to? It depends. So there are a variety of different audiences for which I do different presentations. So I'm not sure what um, not sure what to make of the question or what would be a useful response. So our um, webinars, the audience we typically advertise to are uh, universities, practitioners, folks who have attended some of our events in the past. So the audience of our webinars typically tends to be um, mix, mixed in that regard. And let me just say there's, there's one minute left, so I should probably do my thank yous and then um, my conclusion. Um, but I want to um, give a very special thank you to our presenters, Dr. Dean Fixon. I think he's still with us. And to you, um, Dr. Sonia Schoenwald, thank you so much for uh, taking your time out and, um, and giving us this very important information. Uh, thank you to Stuart Oppenheim and Barry Johnson for letting us know more about the uh, California Implementation Science Collaborative. And say thank you to everyone who participated in this webinar. Um, we'll send out a notice when the recording is available. And uh, please forward it to people who you think may be interested in this, this topic. And um, we'll send out a link to where we have other webinars on the CalSoc website. Uh, so that you can see our, our other topics. And um, we're right at 1130. And this concludes this webinar. And I'd like to say have a great day to everyone on the call. Thank Thanks very much, Savon, and everyone who uh, took the time to be here today. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Please stand by.